Patient assessment is assessing the patient and everything around the scene and understanding what is going on with our patients. It starts off when we first get to the scene and it's gonna end all the way at the end of our patient care. This patient assessment is broken up into five major parts. First, we have scene size up. Scene size up means what do you see when you first get to the scene? And we're gonna break each one of these down, so stay tuned to the end of the video for that. Primary assessment. Primary assessment is gonna be mainly looking for life threats and doing a rapid exam of the patient. History taking is getting the patient's history and we'll have mnemonics for this along the way. The secondary assessments, that is a more detailed assessment, usually in route to the hospital. And reassessment is gonna be continually to reassess our primary and secondary assessments as we are getting closer and closer to the hospital until we transfer care to the nurse or doctor at hospital. Now let's break these down, each one individually, by section. And before we get to help our patient here, we first gotta ensure the scene is safe. Either the scene has been cleared by the police department or dispatch information shows the scene is safe for EMS to enter. So that is ensuring scene safety. With that being said, we're gonna take standard precautions. So we go up to the scene, we have gloves, we may have a mask, we may have a gown, depending on the information that we get on the call, right? Now, one thing on these two things. Next is we're gonna determine which is the NOI and an MOI. What does that mean? An MOI is the mechanism of injury. That's a traumatic call, a trauma call. So if someone's in a car accident, if they fell, we're gonna, we're gonna make a determination what the mechanism of injury is. How did that person get injured? The NOI stands for the nature of illness, means what is the nature, why are they sick? What makes the patient sick? What makes them complain today? That's on the medical side. Now don't forget, you can have a medical and traumatic call in one. We're trying to determine that as we do our scene size up. Like, what do we see? What's going on? What's the dispatch information, right? We've taken standard precautions, already talked about that. The next, the next two, First is determining how many patients. Now, I think about this a lot when we're talking about motor vehicle accidents, right? So we go to a motor vehicle accident, maybe three or four cars. How many patients do we have? And then it reminds me to say, hey, do we need more equipment or more people? So if we have one patient and we're an EMS crew, we should have enough resources. If we have multiple patients, or if we need, let's say, a lift assist with this patient, or we see something in the scene where we need specialized resources that the fire department might have, or we get on scene, whoa, we might need law for this. This is what we talk about, needing more equipment or people, consider getting more help. Now, the first thing I want you to remember with the primary assessment is to expose your patient. Remember, no, it's this patient was wearing a hat, shirt, expose the patient. Remember that's so key, especially in traumatic calls. Now, starting the primary assessment, the general impression. The general impression first is when we first walk up, what do we see? What do we see around the patient in the scene? Who else is with the patient on the scene? And what does the patient look like? That's a general impression. Two extreme examples. An 80 year old female sitting on the couch by herself who appears to be breathing. And then over here, we have a 10 car motor vehicle accident with patients all over the freeway. Two different scenes. That's general impression. Next, we approach our patients and we're gonna say, hey, my name's Evan, I'm with the ambulance. What's going on or what happened today, right? That all works. We're looking for the level of consciousness. Is the patient awake and alert? Do they only respond to verbal commands? Do they only respond to a motor command? or are they completely unresponsive when we approach, right? That's level of conscious. Now, we, that, that, with that being said, with that being said, if someone speaks in full sentences, their airway is patent. They have a patent airway. 
If you're speaking full sentences, again, your airway is open. Now here's, why is there a star on our circulation? Here's why. If you walk up to a patient and you see they have a major bleed externally and they're bleeding out, you need to take care of that life threat first before doing anything else. So you expose your patient, you're going through your station, you expose the patient, major bleed, take care of that first. Then go back to your airway and breathing, okay? That's why the star is here, right? So again, what do I mean by airway? We need to make sure the patient's airway is clear. Speaking of full senses, great. What if they're not? What if they're unresponsive? We have to either do a head tilt chin lift on a medical side or a, draw, a jaw thrust maneuver on a traumatic side to open the airway. Then, once we open the airway, we have to clear the airway. So suction if needed, it could be blood or vomit in the airway, clear it out. Then we gotta keep it open if they're unresponsive, right? So we keep it open with an adjunct, could be an OPA, could be an NPA, right? We wanna keep it open. Then we gotta ventilate our patient, make sure they're breathing, adapt on their breathing, right? So that's see how it all goes together, right? And let's say that patient didn't have any bleeding, you, you would assess obviously how their skin looks, you'd expose the patient, you get a pulse, that's your circulation, right? Now, I wanna give you a few more tips here while I'm here with breathing too. With breathing, look at their chest rise and fall, right? That's a big, huge part. And what is their general respiratory effort, right? Do we hear any abnormal sounds like strider or a wheeze, for example, right? But this is a quick, rapid exam. We can do this very fast. See if we have an airway, assess the chest, how, how does our breathing look, and then expose and look for any major bleeds. Now, the other thing about the rapid assessment when we're talking about trauma, our first mnemonic, I'm gonna put it right here, is DCAP BTLS. This mnemonic will help you when you're scanning your patient. What you're looking for is any deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, Moving on to BTLS, burns, tenderness, lacerations, swelling. You're looking for anything like that when you're doing any of your exams on a physical exam. Now, quick rapid exam, we just go quick rapid, looking for any life threats. The key here is looking for life threats. If you see a life threat, you gotta treat it. Now, once we've done that, transport decision. How critical is our patient right here? Are we going no ice and sirens to the hospital? Are we going light and sirens to the hospital? Does this patient need to be flown out, right? Where are we at with this patient? Are we taking him to the hospital? Are we not taking him to the hospital? This is a transport decision. So at this point, this is all done when we first put the patient. When we're making this transport decision, the next thing we're going to is history taking, right? We're gonna get a patient history if we can, if they're awake, right? This can be done, not always just sitting on scene, getting a history, while we're moving the patient, let's say the stair chair, or moving the patient onto the stretcher, or getting them out of that austere environment. We can get a history. We can talk to bystanders and family that are with the patient if they're not able to get, to get that history. That's coming up next. Now there's three mnemonics, memory tricks that will help you remember content, and then one key fact that you need to learn to understand history taking. The first one is getting a sample history. So sample's a mnemonic. S is for signs and symptoms. So what that means is, what were the signs and symptoms that started on the onset of you deciding to call 911? So essentially, what is going on with you and what happened? A, does the patient have any allergies? M is for medications. What medications does the patient take? Next, is going to be the past medical history. So past medical history of this patient, for example, like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, anxiety, asthma, right? L is last oral intake. When was the last time the patient ate? Something to think about here could also be, when was the last time the patient took their medications, right? And then the final part is E, which is events leading up. Now the next mnemonic I'm, I'm gonna put on the screen right here, it is O, P, Q, R, S, T. So OPQRST 
you can kind of investigate more about the patient's chief complaint. Let's say they had chest pain. So the O. The O stands for onset. So what were you doing? What, what happened when this first occurred at the onset? Right? Where were you? What were the symptoms? When did this first happen? That's onset. Now the next OP, so that we're out of the P, is provokes. Does the pain get better or worse if you sit or stand or lie back? Does anything help? Or does anything make it worse or actually provoke it? Right? That's going to be your P. OPQ, the Q is for quality. So what does the pain feel like? Is it crushing? Is it stabbing? Is it knife-like? Try to let the patient actually describe it. Don't give them, does it feel crushing or knife-like? You're like, ask them, what does it feel like to you? Can you describe it in a little more detail? Or something I like to think about is, have you ever felt this way before? Or does this feel different? That's the quality, right? Now, OPQR, the R, is talking about radiation. So, does this pain go anywhere? Does it radiate anywhere? That's your R. S is severity, one to 10. 10 is the worst pain of your life. One, it's barely an annoyance. I barely feel it. I feel weird even mentioning it. Five, somewhere in the middle, right? So one to 10 pain scale. Now, the last part of the OPQ or ST, T is time. So time is when, about how long it's been going on for. What time was it when this first started? That's your time. Now in this section, I got about history taking, something important, I gotta talk to you about pertinent negatives. So a pertinent negative, what that is, give you an example. We know that if someone is having a heart attack, they may have these sign symptoms. Chest pain, difficulty breathing, some back pain, nausea, vomiting, right? Their medical history could be like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history, smoking, right? To name a few. So if I go to a patient and let's say this patient has chest pain, if I ask the patient about their chest pain and I say, well, you're having chest pain, you're saying it's eight out of 10. Do you have a hard time breathing? Do you have any nausea vomiting? Do you have back pain? Are you a diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? If they say no to all those things, that is what we call a pertinent negative. Meaning, this patient has chest pain, but they have chest pain by itself. Not all these other bad things that could clue that this is really bad. That's good for the patients. And that is to go on your documentation as well. So this is now time for our secondary assessment. If this patient has been emergent at this point, we are in the ambulance, we are on our way to the hospital, we are telling the hospital we're coming, we're getting vital signs, and we're doing a more detailed, what we call secondary assessment, from head to toe in this patient. We exposed the patient earlier, right? We got our first findings with the patient. Now we're gonna go into details. So I'd like to share with you some of these details. So the first thing that we're gonna do here with this patient, I'm just gonna move him up a little bit like this. There we go. Is we're first gonna check the patient's head and we're looking for a DCAP PTLS as we're going along, right? So any signs of trauma here, look behind the ear. Do we have any battle sign behind the ear, right? That could be sign of a bad fracture, head injury, stuff like that, right? Anything coming out of the ears? We can do a pupil exam of the patient. Are the pupils normal? Are they constricted? Are they dilated? Are they equal? Are they unequal? Are they reactive, right, with the pupils? We can go on here, looking at the nose, make sure everything's good there. Look at the cheekbones, the mandible, the actual mouth. We can open your mouth, light in the mouth, right? Scan down to the neck, feel the spine in the back of the neck. We can listen with our scope, which we have right here to our actual trachea, right? We can gather lung sounds on this patient, right? We get lung sounds back. Are they normal? Is there wheezing? Is there rails? Is there ronchi? Is the chest rise and fall equal on both sides? Is one side absent and one side clear? Like a pneumothorax, that would happen, right? We're gonna palpate their abdomen. We're gonna examine the abdomen, right? We're gonna move down to the pelvis. We're gonna scan the legs. Any pain in your legs? 
We're gonna scan the arms, right? We're gonna get pulses along the way while, while we're doing all this. Then don't forget, we're gonna bring the patient forward and we're gonna scan the patient's entire spine on the back, right? So that's gonna be a quick little secondary assessment. Now, there are so many different exams and things you can do on the secondary assessments. But the main thing is, is a more detailed look in your patient and you're doing that during transport. Now, the last part is reassessment. So with this patient, we've done a secondary assessment. Now what do we do? Continue to reassess, get more vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, so heart at your heart rate, respiratory rate, blood glucose, capnography, pulse oximetry. You're gonna learn about all these things, right? Keep doing vitals. Keep doing a physical exam of this patient. And remember, if you're in the ambulance and transport and you've got a really critical patient, you're gonna be radio patching and doing radio communication to the hospital to tell them you got a critical patient. You don't just show up with a critical patient. You wanna warn them in advance what we call a radio patch. So you'll be learning about that in class as well. The first link in the description is lifetime access to my video vault. If you are someone getting ready for school and you want to get a leg up on all this education, you want to learn more, or if you're someone in school right now, you're trying to pass, or if you're someone getting ready for your national registry exam at any level, from responder, EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, the vault includes it all. It's the first link in the description, and you also get access to our community group to ask me questions and network with like-minded providers on the same journey as you. It's the first link down below. I will catch you in the next video. Take care.